Hi, I'm Maria Thea Harris or VeloSos on social media. Welcome back to Sober 50 podcast on So Organized Style. Stay listening. So Organized Style podcast acknowledges traditional owners of country throughout Australia. We pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to the elders past, present and emerging. Thanks for joining us on So Over 50 podcast for this series where we feature sewers who continue with their sewing projects while they live with chronic pain and they're from the So Over 50 community. Andy Wells was one of our So Over 50 sewists featured recently to show how the So Over 50 community does intersect with all communities such as hashtag chronically sewn. In case you've not heard about Andy, they describe themselves as a disabled fat NB babe who is passionate about sewing, fashion, lingerie, swimwear and EDS. Welcome Andy. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast Maria. I'm very excited for it. Andy, I've seen your makes and the issues that you raise on Instagram. So I'm really pleased that you've been able to take the time to come onto this podcast to talk about those issues today. Thank you so much. So how did you develop your online name? My name is Andy with an IE and I am a child of the 80s. <laughs> so in that sense, I love the movie Pretty in Pink with Molly Ringwald and the movie centers around Andy, who is a sewist and creates all of these wonderful garments. She mainly does refashioning and everything like that. When I was a child, I watched that movie and I was like, I want to be that person. <laughs> I want to create those things. Well, turns out I had a bit of a fear of sewing machines. So I didn't start sewing until I was about 28. But <laughs> I had a big passion for creating things. So I did like hand sewing and stuff like that, as well as other needle crafts. And, you know, like created little dresses for a dollhouse or, you know, like a dress for a doll if I wanted to. But in terms of dealing with the sewing machine, I didn't start doing that until I was 28. But the thought of Pretty in Pink stayed in my head and I was like, Pretty in Pink has to be part of my name. And then I was like, it's so Pretty in Pink. <laughs> That's what it is. So it was kind of like this fun thing where I was re-watching it and trying to think of what would my blog name be? And then that came to me. You do realize though that all of those skills that you picked up hand sewing and refashioning are the sort of skills that everyone is interested in now. And hand sewing is one of the key skills for couture sewing as well. Absolutely. And when I started sewing and learning about couture sewing, I realized how many skills I already had. I already had tons of concepts of the construction of sewing already. I knew how to put together a little dress for a doll. And so that translated nicely into a big dress for me. But absolutely, like it was one of those moments where like a light bulb switched on in my head where I was like, I've done this before. Yeah. Like I've literally done this before. It's just the matter of using the sewing machine and getting past that fear because I saw my mom sew through her, <laughs> her finger once. Oh. And I was young and impressionable and just became terrified of it. So I have since gotten over that. She still to this day is like, why are you still talking about that? <laughs> like, because it impacted me. <laughs> you can't get over something like that. So does that mean that you've even hand sewn in zippers? I haven't until I started sewing and then I started using couture sewing methods. So I was sewing in the zippers and for a while I only hand sewed in zippers and never used the machine at all. Because of my dexterity issues, I have trouble gripping the fabric when it's like detailed work like that. So with, with zippers and everything like that, it was just too difficult for me to get the line straight until I learned a bit more and was sewing in different materials and everything that it, and learned different techniques that would help me. So it wasn't until actually probably like four years ago when I started sewing zippers and being like, oh yeah, I do this really well. <laughs> yes. But for forever it was hand sewing zippers. <laughs> so I know that you're passionate about a few topics. So should we start with inclusivity? Sure. I definitely believe that every aspect of sewing should have inclusion incorporated in it. So what does that mean? That means including 
people of all colors, and then also including people of all abilities, people of all sizes, people of all genders. I myself am a fat, non-binary, disabled sewist. So to me, I have many, many intersections. But in spite of those intersections, well, I know a lot about, you know, like being disabled and being non-binary and, and being fat. I don't necessarily know anything about being Black and sewing in this world and what that means entering a predominantly white space as a Black woman or a Black person. And yeah. that, that's tough. And the way that we mitigate that is with inclusivity. And making sure that, you know, whether it's online you know, on Instagram, Facebook, or even on podcasts like this, inclusivity means, you know, making sure that everybody is included. Mm -hmm. If you're managing, you know, like an Instagram account that includes other people in it, that's like the best place to share, you know, like a variety of accounts and, and a variety of experiences as well. And then another way of doing that, if you have a personal account, is within your stories, or you can, like, every once in a while have, like, an upload post where you share something from another maker whose voices maybe not heard as much, and then you uplift them, and you, you give them a moment where they can shine on your platform, and that's especially useful for people who have smaller platforms, too. So... If you're someone who has an Instagram account of, you know, like 4,000 or more, and you're like, you're looking around and seeing there are a couple of accounts that are following you that only have 200 or 300, then maybe you want to include them in your account and see how, you know, like you can reach out to them and how you can incorporate in them. I definitely need to do that more often (laughs) on my personal account because, you know, like I I manage chronically zones. It tends to take my focus for like when I'm sharing and stuff like that. Although in the past year, I've been very sick. So unfortunately, I haven't been able to commit as much time as I want to it. So in that sense, I definitely want to start spotlighting people on my own platform because I think that that's important. From following the Sober 50 account, they do a great job of highlighting and showing people who have small accounts all the time. I don't know how they do it, but they do it all the time and it's just wonderful to see. It really is. That's why I love following the community because it's always like, oh, you know, like that's someone new. And, you know, like then I'll go and I'll look at their stuff, I'll like things and um, often follow people, which is absolutely fantastic. And, you know, like because of that, your Instagram account no longer becomes just a feed of faces that look like you. Yeah. Because that's what Instagram will feed you by default. It'll look at you and it'll say, these are the kind of things that you want to see, but you have to kind of like cultivate your feed into something else so that Instagram is tricked as if it needs to be, but the algorithm itself is biased. So we have to trick the bias and the algorithm and spot the voices that don't get heard. That's good advice. So should we move now on to chronically sewn and accessibility? Absolutely. Chronically Sewn was created, I guess it was three or four years ago, after chatting with a few disabled sewists in the community, and we talked about wanting a place where voices were uplifted. And at the time, So Over 50 had just been created, and a couple of other ones like So Queer or Meet the Makers, that was another one that was created around that time. Then I was like, well... I can do this <laughs> to whatever degree that I could <laughs> or to, ever, to whatever degree that I can at the time, depending on my health, but I can have at least a place where people can go. And then in terms of accessibility and everything like that, it's kind of become my mission to make it clear to everybody that not just able-bodied sewists exist. <laughs> Yes. There's also, you know, like disabled people out there and that it's very important that we make things accessible for a variety of needs. So, you know, like including alt image descriptions, just doing 
captioning on videos now that we have that on Instagram. And that is something that you can actually add to any sort of speaking videos or anything like that. Captioning is a great thing. Also including within videos, and like if you're doing a video at the start, include those visual descriptions because you're not always going to have somebody listening who can fully see. So when you're describing sewing and everything like that, and like, I know it's tons of people who have YouTube channels and they do tutorials and everything like that, but they're often lacking the description of what's going on. So they're, you know, like it's something that can be easily incorporated into sewing tutorials because you're like, now I am taking this piece of fabric and, you know, like folding it over one quarter of an inch. Even just saying something like that is enough for someone who who has visual impairment or is Mm -hmm. blind for them to be able to understand what is going on and what they would need to do to do the exact same thing that the person in the video is doing. So accessibility is very important. And it's not just about online. It's also about in person as well. So making sure that you have wheelchair accessible places. And also another one, which I think a lot of people forget about, and one that I feel very strongly about, is having quiet spaces within events that people can go to if they're overwhelmed in any way, in terms of anxiety or in terms of tiredness, just some place to sit down and be quiet for a moment (laughs) away from everyone else. Because I'm I'm autistic, so I'll have in-person anxiety attacks because of like the number of people and just because it's overwhelming in a sense that there are so many voices happening at once so I'll have an autistic meltdown because of that and for me that exhibits itself with getting very quiet and going to a quiet space and that's all I need to recover and come back to the party and then I'm good to go. So yes, that's a need that I am speaking to for myself, but there are so many other people who need that. Breastfeeding mothers, they would need that space. And there are often mothers coming to these events. So, you know, like that's a number one thing. Or just, you know, like having a spot to go if you, you know, like start getting a headache or a migraine, you know, like there's a variety of experiences out there. So that quiet spot. <laughs> it's, it's something not a lot of people think about, but it's so, so very appreciated when it's there. Absolutely. So I have a question. Because there have been less in-person events because of lockdowns and restrictions, have you had the experience of going to an online event? And what's that like for you? I went to a couple most recently. It was the Sewing Weekender. Yes. And that was fabulous. It was so much fun. And I love that the way that I love, I love the way they did it, which is they posted all of the videos and allowed you to watch it on your own time. So that meant that, you know, like I could take breaks and go off and do something else, go for a walk, come back, watch some more videos. And the social time was optional as well. I've done a couple of Zoom sewing circles and they're great. It just tends to be a lot of people talking at once. So the optional or I know that with Sewing Weekender, they had little tiny rooms that you could go to and you could keep on moving in the room. So that was kind of nice too. That weekend though, I was not well enough to be able to socialize. So I opted out, but you know, like I've, I've taken part in a couple of sewing circles here and there, but I find overall right now, accessibility is much better because of the pandemic and the fact that, you know, it's not safe to gather in large, uh, large amounts. To me, it's, I just don't want it to go away after the pandemic. (laughs) I don't want it to stop. And I don't want that sort of experience like the sewing weekender to go away because I'm not going to be able to travel to England anytime soon (laughs) for an (laughs) in-person event. Having that, it also makes it far more of a of a global community too, because we sort of tend to be like in our little bubbles. But like the sewing weekender, I felt like I was part of like this global event that was like everybody was talking about it on like different sides of the world at different times too. And we were all just enjoying the content and loving it and talking about each other. And that's what I really, really above everything. I loved that. And 
that accessibility aspect of it. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so good. When the Sang Weekend up was made online last year, they set the bar for other online sewing events and they've put so much thought into it initially and this year. They're such thoughtful people and I really do hope that they run it again next year as well. Me too. And I hope that it it gets even more people and it gets even more popular that maybe we could do it more than once a year, but uh, that requires everybody sort of collectively agreeing to it and say, and letting the Sewing Weekend our team know that we loved it and we want it back in the exact yes. same way that it was before. <laughs> in person is great, but just that being able to do it on your own time and manage your own energy and manage your own, you know, like attention span and everything like that fantastic absolutely most accessible event I've been to lately excellent I hope that they hear this I hope so too (laughs) on the topic of accessibility are there for you specific tools or notions that make your sewing life easy Absolutely. One of the things that I use, which is sort of an unconventional tool, is a pair of surgical tweezers <laughs> or clamps. Basically, it's got a way of being able to pinch something and then lock it in position so that you can hold on to the surgical clamps and not have to grip like whatever it is so tightly. So because you've got the grip say it's a piece of elastic and you're trying to, you know, like pull the elastic as you sew, that sort of thing is very difficult if you don't have very good dexterity in your fingers or if you have hypermobile fingers like I do. So if I did that, I would be at risk of either, well, let's just say, (laughs) because I don't want to, I don't want to make anybody squeamish or have to do a trigger warning. Let's just say I will hurt myself if I try and pull it back with my fingers versus the surgical clamps. So that one's a great one. And I don't even have to like, when I'm pulling it, I can just like use the handles to be able to pull. And then it's much less on me and more on the surgical tongs. So they're doing most of the work for me for pulling that elastic. It also helps if I'm putting the elastic through, you know, like a channel or say I'm just trying to hold something (laughs) and I need an extra hand. (laughs) It's great for that. So I, I actually think that everybody should have surgical clamps in your sewing tools. Other than that, I have a lot of ergonomic tools. So I have an ergonomic seam ripper and then, uh, I'm slowly getting more ergonomic scissors to me. But I also do things in unconventional ways because I'm not financially flush anyway. (laughs) So it's about what I have access to and what I can afford. So people have given me things along the way and that's always been grateful. The fact is that I have lots of duplicates of things and having duplicates of things around your sewing area is really, really useful if you have limited energy. Having a pair of scissors where you're ironing something as well as right beside your sewing machine, as well as beside your cutting table, wherever you cut it. Multiples of them. That's what you do (laughs) because that means you don't have to walk all the way across the room or even if you're, say your cutting area is in a completely different area. (laughs) Like... You don't have to walk all the way back or you don't have to take all your tools with you. They're just always there and available to you. So you can reduce the amount of energy that you use finding them. That's a huge tip in in accessibility for me. If you can, obviously, financially, it's, it's not always possible, but... If you can, multiples of things, and that includes seam rippers, that includes anything that you would normally like have on hand, Mm -hmm. like a ruler or, you know, like sewing, measuring tight, anything like that. Basically have them in every single area that you would be doing something. (laughs) And then set up stations too. Like that's the other thing. Like when I'm sewing, I'll set up my ironing station and then I'll have, you know, like an area where, you know, like I'll, I'll have things laid out and I'll be able to sort of like do my pinning there and everything like that. And I'll have, you know, like a thing of pins there, but I'll also have a thing of pins over by my sewing machine. 
So I have like different stations and then that allows you to also, you know, like maximize what you're doing in that time. So if there's like a couple of seams that I need to sew, I'll do many seams at once and then I'll go over to the ironing station Mm -hmm. and then I'll iron it all at once. And then if I need to pin again, I'll go to the pinning station and I'll pin it all at once, but I won't do everything within the order of operations in the pattern anymore because I've been sewing for, we'll just say many years. Many years, yes. <laughs> I'm now 40. I've been sewing since I was 28, so 12. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I did math. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I won't do everything in the order of operations, which also helps manage my energy too, because you can always sew shoulder seams at once. And then like you take it over, you iron both the shoulder seams at once. (laughs) All of the sewing instructions usually say, do this, then press, do this, then press. Mm -hmm. Well, might as well just do it all at once, as long as you can in terms of like the construction of something, like obviously you can't, you know, like sew the, the side seams and, you know, like expect to be able to hem first before you sew the side seams, unless like that's the order of operations. So I'll have stations set up where I'll be doing a specific thing for a specific amount of time. And then I'll also set timers too, because as a person with a chronic illness who has limited energy, there are times where I can only do something for 30 minutes and then I have to stop and then I have to go and rest. And that's something that Purple Sewing Cloud taught me. Sam taught me that. It meant so much to me at that time. And, and I very much appreciate them posting about how they're, you know, like managing sewing time and all of that. So yeah, that's what I do in terms of accessibility. I'm sure that there's tons more that I'm forgetting. <laughs> the things that you do to make sure that your sewing time doesn't tie you out are so intrinsic that, you know, you've only told us a small amount of what you do but honestly all of the information that you've told us about is really valuable and I know it's going to be useful to a lot of people who are listening. Yeah and I think that it's it's something that we don't often tell especially newer sewists. We don't tell them that you don't have to do everything the way that it says. It's very important when you're starting out that you do certain things you know like along the correct lines. And I use air quotes for that. You can do things the correct way, but you can also do things that work better for you. So if the correct way doesn't work for you because of, you know, like limited mobility or limited vision, then try a different way. Or if that method of construction doesn't make sense to you, as a new sewist, we often discount our own feelings about those things and say, oh, I shouldn't do it that way because the thing said to do it this way, but this way hurts or this way is, I can't see it that way. Or, you know, like it could be a multitude of reasons. So having that, like, it's okay, you can deviate from the instructions. And then also, you know, like having someone around who who says that to them, it's tough when you're first starting out to know what's right and what isn't. But for me, I like to enforce the fact that there is no right way of doing it. It's about being right for you and managing your own energy and your own emotions about it. Just writing down, do what's right for you. Yep. (laughs) When did you discover the Sew Over 50 community? So I think that I started following you immediately. (laughs) Big fan of socialists. I miss them already. Yes, (laughs) thank you. And yeah, (laughs) basically the second that they posted, I, I pressed follow. I've been a fan of the community for quite a while. I am slowly creeping up to 50, so I will soon be a part of it. Still 10 years, but you know, I'm getting there. I think that the whole concept and the whole idea behind the community is great because especially in the wider society, we tend to favor youth. One of the things that I get told very often as a disabled person, oh, you look so young. How can you be disabled? You look so young. And I'm like, disability doesn't just belong to the over 50. It often does because that's what we see and that's the concept of disability. So to me, it's like, 
if the rest of the world views me as a disabled person and they're thinking that only it belongs to like the elderly, what are they doing to the elderly? Like, <laughs> how are they treating people over 50? How are they treating people who are not part of like the major images in media? So to me, it was like, yes, absolutely. This should be a community within our sewing community because you know, we do have this obsession with youth and health. And I think that having more people over 50 would help inject us with a bit of, a bit more inclusivity in terms of understanding that there are many people over 50 that, that are far more active than I will, could ever be. <laughs> and like, there's so many people that, you know, like it encapsulates that, you know, like just forgetting about someone the moment that they turn 30, because that seems to be like the year these days, forgetting about someone is not right and should not happen. So of course, you know, like I, I followed Sober 50 immediately and I'm excited to be part of the community one day. <laughs> <laughs> and be proudly like using the hatch hashtag and saying, I, yeah, I'm so over 50. <laughs> I know that it's 50 onwards, but we have people who are over 50 and under 50 who are part of the community. So again, it's trying to be inclusive Yeah. in the same vein that So Enabled is a community that intersects as well to have a safe space for people who live with various challenges in their life. Yeah, and uh, So Enabled was only started, I guess it was last year? Seems like uh, 2020 was 40 years <laughs> in itself. <laughs> yeah, so we just started that last year. And the whole concept behind that is having a specific place and not just an Instagram account or anything like that, but having a website that people can go to and see what accessible patterns are out there and what accessible businesses are out there as well. We are a group of people with chronic illnesses. Things will definitely not go as fast as most other accounts that you would see. So just, you know, like follow us and be patient as we like start posting stuff and getting stuff out there. I know that out of our group, including me and a couple of other people had some pretty tough things happen in 2020. We're all kind of, you know, like just slowly crawling out of like the yeah. bad experience and then coming back. I mean, those are the things that happen and it's okay when that kind of step back happens and then people come back. Hopefully we'll still have an audience. I mean, we've been posting on So Enabled. I'm talking about mainly about chronically so, but it looks like there's already been like a really, really great amount of feedback and commenting on even just the announcement of the Slow Project Challenge. So I think that people are really excited to see me back. Oh, yeah. And absolutely like excited for the fact that my health is much better. <laughs> it is good. Yeah, it's, it's great that you've been able to get through it to this point. Mm -hmm. Good on you, Andy. So tell us about the Slow Project Challenge. It is a challenge that runs over three months. When I first started it, this is its third year running. When I first started it, I had this concept in my head that it's a way of favoring rest above everything else. Our community tends to favor production above everything else, which is very difficult when you are a low productivity sewist. Many would argue that I am the opposite. <laughs> I mean, I do. I do still sew a lot. I have taken a bit of a break recently just because we moved and uh, I haven't really been feeling like sewing yet. The Slow Project Challenge is a challenge where, you know, favoring rest above everything else, whereas you've always been quite active with your sewing and you've had a break and now you've come back to it. So that's really great for us. Yeah. And, you know, I don't expect to go back to that level of productivity just because it wasn't really sustainable for my health. So, you know, like I'm going to be coming back with like small projects here and there, but uh, I'm excited for that. The Slow Project Challenge is a challenge that I created to emphasize the importance of rest. And so there's no finished project necessary for it. All that's necessary is that you share the hashtag slow project challenge 
all one word. Try and use capital letters for the S and the <laughs> P and the, and the C. And the C. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those types of hashtags are always better ones. You don't have to complete anything by the end of it. As long as you're sharing with the hashtag and everything, you'll be included within the random prize draw on the, at the end. And they usually have quite a variety of prizes. It doesn't necessarily mean that everybody is going to be guaranteed to get a prize, but lots of people will. You know, like the whole idea behind it is to de-emphasize that concept of constantly producing something for sewing and producing it for Instagram or your blog or a podcast or this or that, but constant production, which isn't necessarily sustainable in general, it mimics fast fashion really, which isn't great because that's also another way of destroying our environment by like the constant use of materials. And it makes a difference if you're always wearing what you're sewing. <laughs> um, absolutely. But you know, like there's eventually a point where your entire wardrobe is full. And I speak from experience from that. I got to a point where my wardrobe was full I could start working on my partner's wardrobe for sure. I got to that point and I was like, well, I just want to focus on one project and focus on being mindful with that project. So that mindfulness and really like digging into something and feeling that connection to it is what is behind the slow project challenge. So last year, what I did was I mended a quilt that my grandmother and my mother made for me when I was a baby. So to me, that was a huge undertaking because there were several squares that had been destroyed. So I had to do uh, hand sewing and all of that stuff. I also felt a deep connection to, you know, like my mother and my mother's mother as well. And that kind of deep meaningfulness that you can get from being mindful and slow with your projects and taking your time with them is something that we don't take advantage of enough. So that's kind of what I really like about it. And I feel like the chronic, chronically ill community is very supportive of it. I encourage people who aren't chronically ill to take part in it as well, just because it gets the message out and it gets that message out about, you know, like, why don't we be a little bit more mindful about our projects or at least take one project and take a more time with it. Do those techniques that you've always wanted to try out and just haven't or try that fabric that you are afraid to touch. <laughs> you know, like take your time with it and enjoy those tactile sensations. That's what slow sewing is all about. It's all about that pure enjoyment of the craft, you know, like it's, it's wonderful. I can see the value of the slow project challenge, especially if it's something that, you know, is the precious fabric that you don't want to cut into and maybe now is the time to actually do that and do it over a three-month period. Don't rush it. For this year, I am going to be doing a very special project, which kind of was inspired by the quilt from last year. I have some vintage silk fabric from my maternal grandmother, and I'm going to use it. I have not decided what yet. <laughs> I've only just petted it. <laughs> And thought about thought about what I would do, but it, it will happen. Uh, and I'm very, very excited about working with that fabric. And you can continue to pat it through the whole three month period, right? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, like if you take that extra extra amount of time to just think about what you're gonna do, yeah, that's totally okay. What advice would you give listeners who want a more accessible sewing experience? I would advise them to do whatever they can within their own spaces to make it as accessible as possible for their own needs. And remember that not one size fits all. I think that we often think, oh, I'm this, so I need this. For example, I have EDS. So I need, what do I need from sewing? <laughs> I need to, you know, like manage how my fingers are being used because of dexterity dexterity issues. But that doesn't mean that my solution is going to work for someone else with EDS. 
And that's something that I think that we don't think about often enough, that it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. And so in that sense, asking businesses and everything for what you need specifically will help and also explaining why you would need that. So if you happen to be going to in-person sewing event, I highly encourage you. I know it's very, very tough, but to advocate for yourself and to ask the organizers if they have what you need. Most people, most, not all, respond quite nicely to that. There's definitely some people who will not respond at all, which is unfortunate, but it also tells you that that's not the event for you. And maybe they should know that. You know, like if I have been in many situations where I have reached out for more information and not heard back, and then I have replied several weeks later and said, I have not heard back. Mm -hmm. So I will not be attending this event because of these reasons. So, you know, like even that, I encourage you to do that because nobody is going to know what disabled people need more than disabled people themselves. And nobody can tell us that we don't need something. I mean, they can try, but (laughs) if we need it, we need it. And we need to say what we need to, which is a great message to remind people about. And it's hard. It's really, really hard to do that. It's a very vulnerable situation to put yourself in. Ask mm-hmm. for what you need when, it's, when it differs from the rest of the world, really. If you avoid doing that, that's okay too. But, you know, like if you really, really, really want to make sure that something is accessible for you, you're going to have to ask. And don't think you're the first person to ask because you're not, you won't be the first and you certainly won't be the last. No, exactly. And everybody who is the first person to ask is going to be terrified. So if you're, if you're feeling anxious or anything I, about something like that, I highly recommend that you just reach out to me over Instagram, um, either with So Pretty in Pink or with Chronically Sewn, and I am more than happy to be an ear for you or an eye, I guess, on Instagram <laughs> if we're messaging each other. But uh, I'm more than happy to talk it out because I think that, like, I think talking to other disabled or chronically ill people is a massive thing that you can do for yourself because it reduces how much you feel alone. It's a very scary and also difficult experience to be a disabled person in the world because, as I talked before, we have this emphasis on health and we have this emphasis emphasis on youth and all this you know, is incorporated with all of the other things in this world, like patriarchy and, you know, like capitalism and racism and stuff like that. But talking to someone else who knows, or at least can understand what you're going through is going to be huge. So my other advice is to just reach out to other people like me or in the community and find your people that you can talk to about this. And maybe, maybe we can all get together and create events that, that are accessible. Um, and maybe when p- other people see that our, event, our accessible events are doing really well, then maybe other people will, will take the, you know, the mantle up and, and be able to, to fight for us too. Andy, thank you so much for keeping the conversation going about inclusivity, accessibility, and making sure that sewing is available for everybody. Thank you so much for having me. And have a lovely day, listeners. This episode of Sew Organised Style Podcast for Sew Over 50 was produced by me, Maria Thea Harris, with permission of Andy Wells, sound by bensound.com. You can subscribe to Sew Organised Style Podcast, spelt with an S, not a Z, on all good podcast apps and give us a five-star rating and review. You can also support us on our Patreon account. Make sure you listen to our previous free Sew Over 50 podcasts and hear from great people from the Sew Over 50 community. All Sew Organised Style podcasts are free to keep you company and make you smile. Post any questions or podcast suggestions you have on our podcast website at seworganisedstyle.com or on our Instagram account, seworganisedstyle, or on our Facebook page. We look forward to joining you in your sewing room next time. Stay safe, everyone.